the old Fox truck, go ahead. Yes, Oscar Fox truck control. Listen, uh, I'm in attendance here at uh, Delta 514. There's another premises at the back of this place on fire as well. So, send three pumps to a separate fire in the same vicinity. You will probably need to TN. Yeah, it looks like it's going to go through the roof. Over. In the dead of night, a major fire has broken out in an industrial estate north of Dublin city centre. A large warehouse is ablaze. The fear is that the fire may spread to other units and destroy the entire complex. There's no time to wait for the keys to arrive. Firefighters need to gain access quickly before the situation becomes out of control. It was a complex fire because we had uh, several different types of units. We had uh, a mattress warehouse, we had a, a garage workshop, um, and there were seen to be several points of ignition of the fire, so there were several areas of attack that we had to go. At the rear of the warehouse, another crew saw a gate open. This fire is proving difficult to get access to, and there are several hidden dangers. The beams in the roof have melted and are starting to fall down. A turntable ladder adds to their aerial power. From a rooftop vantage point, it's clear just how difficult this fire will be to contain. The buildings are all interlinked, and the roof could collapse at any moment. The raging fire requires a robust tactical assault from all angles before it blazes out of control. Due to the gravity of the situation, Chief Fire Officer Pat Fleming has been called to the scene. At the incident command unit near the site of the fire, he is given an update by the officers in charge. So what we've done is we have a tour table ladder on one end, HP at the other end, and ground monitors. Down along here too, we have access in through some windows and shutters that there's holes cut in the shutters, uh, and the ground monitors are directed in there. The main danger is the walls come down, obviously. And we're just after being heard now that there's a possibility of acetylene cylinders in one of the units is unconfirmed. So we're, somebody heard it somewhere off somebody. Okay. Yeah. I'll try and get as much as you can. Yeah, so just going to dig into that a bit more. Yeah, yeah, back yeah, to yeah, it. Yeah. to Delta 106. Uh, 106, as per request of the old Foxtrot. Can you pull back from that fire? Uh, we have a report of acetylene cylinders underneath you, over. Yeah, Roger, yeah. In all industrial fires, there are potential hazards within the building. Any kind of compressed gas cylinders, when they heat up, what you would have is something maybe this size um, expanding rapidly in an explosion to several thousand times that, that volume uh, and decimating everything in its way. The fire is ravenous. It's feeding on the contents of the warehouse. Station officer John McNally knows they are facing an uphill battle as this situation is becoming more serious by the minute. So we have a number of industrial units on fire. The problem here is that all of the units are actually attached to each other, which is quite unusual. So the fire has actually jumped from one building to the next. So it's actually spread into, into three units now at this stage. The difficulty we have here at the moment is we're in defensive mode. We can't fit any, any fire furs into the buildings for obvious reasons, because the, the roofs are starting to collapse in, in, inwardly, so we're trying to fight the fire from the outside. So we're up here in the roof at the moment, trying to pack up the fire. We've a torn type ladder as well made down. we sector one, two, three, and four, so the whole incident is completely surrounded. Because of the way the buildings actually attached to each other, we can't surround the building like you normally would, so we're having great difficulty uh, keeping the fire at bay to spread into other buildings at the moment. Today is a landmark in the lives of 25 people. For the first time in five years, a batch of fresh-faced recruits will assemble here at the O'Brien Institute and discover over the next six months if they have what it takes to be Dublin firefighters. This day has been building up for months. You're obviously, you're excited, but you're nervous. You're just, as well as a bit of fear as well, like that you, it's the, you're going into the unknown. It's my great pleasure as Chief Fire Officer to welcome you here today as you begin your career. You are joining a service which has a long and proud history. It requires commitment to society and in particular your desire to help people in their hour of need. I hope it will be a long and fulfilling career for all of you. You'll be very much excited, you know, and kind of adrenaline rushing as well, and you're probably terrified at the same time. I was a self-employed electrician, my own uh, small business, electrical business. I'd worked with disadvantaged families, had done a lot of volunteer work. There was no doubt in my mind that I was 
going to go for it. Look at who's around you. Look at who's in front of you. Look at who's behind you. And remember the position you're in. When you fall in in the morning, we'll be falling in along here. OK, and that's the position that you take. 13 years I was based in City Council. The fire brigade was always a goal. Uh, I'd applied for it once before in 2006. It was unsuccessful, obviously, at that stage. Uh, it was always in the back of my mind to try again. Finally got my chance about six, seven years later. Before each day of training begins, the recruits must present themselves in uniform for inspection. The trainees are representing the entire Dublin Fire and Ambulance Service, so not a hair can be out of place. They will be called out by their sub-officer for even a stray speck of dust on their uniform. It's a huge change and you do have to adapt and you have to adapt very quickly. It was odd to have somebody shouting and screaming in your face and ordering you around for four hours a day. Having to press iron your trousers and your shirt for the third time in a day can get old, but it's part of the learning process. Morning, everybody. Morning, Morning sir. Mr. Bergen. Yes, sir. Miss Berry. Yes, sir. Mr. Bow. Yes, sir. Mr. Owens. Yes, sir. Mr. Quinn. Yes, sir. Mr. Regan. Yes, sir. Miss Shield. Yes, sir. Morning, Mr. Owens. Morning, sir. You just straighten that belt up as off the centre, yes? Yes, sir. OK. Good work on those boots. Yes, sir. Morning, Mr. Drum. Morning, sir. Good work on those boots. Thank you, sir. Big improvement on yesterday. Well done. Everybody coming in here knew, maybe they didn't realise to the extent, but you know, or you should know, what you, what you were kind of getting yourself into. Head forward. Next shave, OK? You, you keep your mouth shut, keep your head down, you just work hard. If there's something wrong, you fix it. You don't question it, you just do it. Well done. Good turnout there this morning, everybody. OK, you can see the efforts that are being put in there for this morning, yes? Yes, sir. Yes, sir. Yes, sir. Everybody fit and well? Yes, sir. Excellent. When entering the fire brigade, I thought I was fit. Day one, week one, I realised I wasn't fire brigade fit. The huge variance on their background, huge variance in relation to their expectations of what they would consider tough. Some of the people who might have a sporty background, they might actually fool themselves into thinking that this is going to be a doddle. Rolling that hose, we only did it half a dozen times the first time, and after the second or third time I did it, I thought it was going to pass out. I want to see passion. I want to see teamwork. Is that understood? I can't hear you. The officers spend most of their time roaring and shouting at you and pushing you. Come on, lad. Come on. After the first few days, guys will be sore and aching and pains, lifting stuff and carrying stuff. You think you're fit and you think you're prepared when you're doing it in your full gear. Definitely makes a big difference and makes it much more physically demanding. It's great passion. That's what we want. Passion. We're putting a bit of teamwork there as well, which is good. I'm pleased with that now to keep proceeding. Come on, don't be fixing. Get over there, Lloyd. Yes. Well done, Syndicate 3. Hands up in the air. Come on. It hits you the morning of the second day when you wake up and you're sore in places that you never knew existed. And you're more tired than you've ever been before and you're only on the start of day two. So you know it's going to be a long six months. We've had a report that there's a male after going underneath a tram there. Yeah, he's right underneath now, so I'd say that'd be a full response from yourselves. And he's gone under the tram. He's gone under the tram, is what I've heard, yeah. Fire now, let's go ahead, caller. There's a fella here, I'm getting knocked down by the Lewis. What road are you on at the moment? Charles Street West. There. Charles Street West. Is he awake? I'm breathing, yeah. Oh, oh. Any obvious injuries? Oh. Yeah, bleeding from the head. In the heart of the city, a pedestrian has been in an accident with a moving Lewis tram. The area is at a standstill. Multiple units are already at the scene. The collision looks serious. Advanced paramedics have been called in to gauge the extent of the casualties' injuries. An important part of our, our whole fire emergency medical service that we provide is our advanced paramedics. Our advanced paramedics are trained to a very, very high standard to be able to give advanced life support at an incident. When we arrived on scene, the paramedics had already done an initial assessment of the patient. 
our role then is to complement the work that the paramedics have done and to be able to provide a higher level of care for the patient. We could see quite an obvious fracture of his upper arm. Before we were to start trying to mobilise the patient, we needed to get heavier pain relief. Intravenous access is the quickest way to get pain relief into the patient's system. We don't always find patients in prone or semi-prone positions like lying down or sitting up in bed. When dealing with a patient face down, there are different difficulties that you have to deal with. It needs a lot of teamwork, people working together to get the patient on their back so we can then start the rest of the assessment process. When you have a casualty sustained a lot of injuries, there needs to be a lot of simultaneous activity, immobilising broken bones and inserting IVs, immobilising the head, getting the collar on. That teamwork is it's crucially important at that stage to try and reduce the amount of time the patient is on the ground. And that, that's a continuous process right into the back of the ambulance and in the ambulance on transit into the hospital as well. It doesn't stop to give the patient the best possible chance. We are a fire EMS based service. That's always exemplified at an incident like this. And essentially with the attendance of paramedics and advanced paramedics, we are essentially bringing the hospital to that person on site. And that's the idea of having a fire EMS based system. There's a high volume of Lewis will travel through the city on a daily and nightly basis. And a huge incidence uh, with the Lewis drivers having spoken to many of them is is that people wandering across junctions with their earphones in because the Lewis is quite silent by its nature. And by the very nature that they're on a track, they can't swerve. I think as a public, we just need to be aware of that. At the industrial complex, the fire continues to burn intensely. At least eight units are on the scene now. The firefighters are operating from three different rooftop points, with two turntable ladders leading the charge. But the walls of the building may soon buckle in this heat. Station officer McNally keeps watch. We're spreading waters at the moment. The danger now is the gable wall of this particular premises is it looks like it's going to collapse quite shortly. Um, we've got horizontal vertical cracks in the nation. We pull the crews back. I can't get 30 metres just in case that, that, that does happen. We're actually pulling from the pool the next building, which is adjoined to this building, which is a billet providers, which is full of timber. So we're keeping that, that wall cool at the moment with water. And we also have a team in there, another team, another points in there as well, trying to keep that, that, that side of the building cool. Inside an adjacent building, water is sprayed on the walls to keep them cool and prevent the fire from spreading. Sub Officer Paul Kyo oversees the firefighters' efforts. We're here in the far side of where the actual fire is. What's happening is that the fire is jumping across the roofs. So we're trying to stop the fire from coming into this warehouse here. And as you can see, there's lots of flammable materials around the place here. So we're dampening it down, trying to keep the fire out and save this unit. A breathing apparatus crew prepares to enter the unit to determine if the fire is continuing to spread. Inside it will be pitch black, but a thermal imaging camera will help guide them through the maze-like warehouse. Level 
in adjoining premises, you need to be sure that the fire isn't spreading in there. The brighter the picture is in the thermal image camera, the hotter that object is. So if something is really, really bright, you know you have a hot spot there. Certainly you will have to monitor that to make sure that it doesn't cause uh, fire spread by radiated heat. So we look along, especially cracks along a wall or a joint between a ceiling and a wall, which might be shared between the building next door, uh, attic spaces, um, service ducts, you know, corner joints and areas and joists where heat will be penetrating through to make sure that they weren't overheating and just keep, keep monitoring that over a continued period of time. You have a number of industrial units all connected together. That whole block, it's about, I'd say, 80 metres long. That whole block, subdivided into other units, is all gone from, from one end to the other, completely gone. The roof is all come down. This wall here is definitely about to go. That wall here, part of it is gone already, and the rest of it's about to go. The only one that, that I think... So that's broken into is here. Yeah. Okay, okay. Uh, it's packed floor to ceiling, yeah. two floors full of mattresses. And bed frames, yeah. So uh, that, that, that's our main concern. That's our, our highest risk at the moment. The new group of trainee firefighters are on the march. Slowly but surely, they're beginning to look the part. They're starting to walk with pride in the uniform. And director of the recruit course, Rob Tierney, is pleased with their progress. We're on day 15, so it's the end of week three. They're starting to gel together, and that's what we really aim for in these initial basic weeks. They may be coming from jobs where they've been working on their own, whereas in the fire service, they have to work together. Every crew, whether they're on the ambulance or the fire appliance, they have to be able to work together as a group or as a team. Today, the trainees will face their first exams, a test of the firefighting abilities they've learned so far. It's high pressure. There's a lot at stake and they cannot afford to fail. This is the basic three weeks and unless you can actually sign off on this, you won't be pushed forward to the specialised training. If a DO comes over to you and asks you a question, when you're standing off on the drill, I don't want any of you talking to each other, standing at ease, looking nice and sharp. If they ask you a question, I want you to come to attention, and don't forget it's DO, yes DO. You know, they've only done a couple of weeks basic training. You're having operation DOs who have vast experience within the organisation. They're coming out to have a reflection, have a look at the recruits to see how they're getting on. And if they don't make it on the day, it means they're, they won't be moving on. If you don't pass this, today could be the end of it. Like, if you drop a ladder on somebody, it's over. So there's a bit of pressure. Bit of pressure. The exam this afternoon will be rigorous. Their physical strength and hunger for the job will be pushed to the absolute limit. Station Officer Martin McCabe gives them their final orders ahead of the test. Everybody fitting well? Yes, yes sir. sir! Everybody ready for this? Yes, yes sir! Okay, if you're asked a question by the operation of DO, answer the question. Is that understood? Yes, yes sir! Yes, if you don't know the answer, say, I'm not too sure. Is that understood? Yes, yes sir! Don't try and lie to catch you out. They know the answers. Is that understood? Yes, yes sir! Make them! Well. Turn the lift and lift! Left wheel! Left wheel! Wheel! And head in! Right down there. Water on! Good stuff. First time. On the road! That's still high, guys. You gotta go down. Come on, guys. Let's bring it Japan. Come on. Come on, let's go. Get the wall. Oh, I got it, I got it, I got it, I got it. I got it. Flip it, flip it, flip it. Come on, flip it, all fire, fire. Oh, boy. It's, it's tough work, like. I'm sure they're beginning to realise it's not as easy a job as they thought it was coming in, like, you know? <laughs> it's a lot more difficult, a lot more physical. It's very, very physical, like, you know? The syndicate officers would have hit home with them exactly what's expected of them, because this is what the public expects. They're worried about how their performance is going to be. 
they know there's a bit of pressure on them. You can feel the tension in the air, and that's good. We need that because operationally, when they go to an incident, they have to be able to channel that adrenaline into performing specific tasks and not creating problems for themselves or putting themselves at risk. Stand for Wanda! We knew we had to perform that day to show them, like a lot of emotion that day and a lot of uh, high intensity stuff going on, you know. Um, guys looking to, to show that they can do it, you know. All happy? Yeah. Finally, after more than four hours of work in the dead of night, the blaze at the industrial complex has been extinguished. Some units remain behind to hold the building down and make sure the fire doesn't reignite. District Officer Mark Wilson knows it could have been much worse. Uh, this particular incident was very tricky and was very dangerous because of the layout of the building and there were so many buildings connected together. There was one unit fully engulfed well, we actually saved two other premises. One was a warehouse full of mattresses. That would have been fairly serious because of the fire loading. If that went on fire, that whole premises would have been fully engulfed as well. It's time for the recruits to get their results. District Officer Dave Kavner gives his verdict to the anxious trainees. Uh, the o okay, yeah. Uh, keep this short and brief. I must say, uh, it's a pleasure to come out here and I'm delighted to be invited out to see us. Uh, you are only three weeks into it, and I must say, after looking around all of you, are all coming on really, really well. Thanks, Leo. Parade! Attention! Parade! Fall out! You feel so much better. It gives you a confidence boost to show, OK, well, I've shown off what I can do so far, and they're impressed, so I suppose it can only get better, really. And that's when you knew, instead of looking at the entire six months in one big block, break it down into each week, each day, each task, and once you completed that, you knew, OK, that's something else I can either take off, it's a new skill, or I'm just one step closer now to passing it.